All right, well, this morning I've already told you what it is we're looking at, and uh, what I'd like to do is just return to a portion of what we were looking at last week, which was the sheep and goat judgments, uh, to look specifically at what Jesus has to say about the goats, what's going to happen to them, because this is going to set the theme for what we're looking at this morning, which is the doctrine of hell. So Matthew 25, I'd like to read for you verses 41 through 46. Again, the context is Christ comes in his glory. He's already gathered all mankind before him. He makes a separation between them. He judges them based upon what they do. We're going to see what the judgment for the goats is here because I'm going to read just that portion again. But then we see the final separation and where it is they go. Beginning in verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, again, for all the, the content of that, I would refer you to last week's uh, sermon if you didn't uh, get that. But by way of review, remember last time we were looking at this passage. And this passage is talking about the final judgment. We noted last time that there's only one final judgment and there's not three. That it will take place when Jesus returns... And he will return after all his enemies have been subdued to destroy the last enemy, which is death. And that he will do that by raising the dead, all the dead, rapturing all the living. And rapturing means taking them up and gathering them together. And he's going to raise all the dead and gather all the living because he's bringing everyone together for the final judgment. Now, here's one thing that we saw last week that we can be very thankful for, and that is that in Christ, all of our guilt, all of our sins have been removed, and the only thing we will be judged for on that day are the works that we have done for Christ that we might be rewarded by His grace. I don't think the Lord's going to parade our sins they have been removed as far as the east is from the west. On that day, we'll be presented before him absolutely spotless and blameless in Christ. And the only thing that, again, will be evaluated will be the works that we have done for him. But sadly, it won't be the case. That will not be the case for the unrepentant. They will be judged for every sin that they have committed, every sinful action, every sinful motive of their heart, every sinful thought and intent, even every idle word that they have spoken, it will all be weighed in the balance and sentence will be meted out to them accordingly. And then, by the way, we're going to look at that a little bit more this morning. And then will come about the final separation. The righteous will enter into his eternal kingdom. We didn't read this part uh, this morning, but then the king will say to those on his right, and again, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus, this is what he will say to us. Come, you who, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, that's our topic for next week. You know, kind of want to end this series on a very positive note. But the wicked will go into the eternal fire, as we've just read. He will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And it's really that punishment that we want to focus on this morning. Now, the reason 
we're doing this, as I said, are, are, are three. We do, I think, need to be reminded from time to time that the people that we are aware of out in, in the world who are not trusting in Christ, and, and, and even those who say they have but really aren't living as though they have, we should assume they're not believers, that they are in danger, okay? And this is the danger that, that they are, well, liable to. We need to be aware of that and keep that before our eyes. Um, we need, secondly, I think, to be reminded of what it is the Lord uses in order to bring people to himself. I, I told you before that Jonathan Edwards found the doctrine of hell to be the most effective in reaching people for Christ. I, I, you know, he has the reputation of being a hellfire and brimstone preacher, and people resent him for that. But the question is, why did he, why did he do that? And he reasoned this way. He said, well, you know, people are, are more concerned about danger that is near than of some blessing that is far off that, um, you know, that isn't immediately in front of them. In other words, they're more concerned about avoiding pain than, than of missing out on pleasure. And we do need to bear in mind as well that for the unconverted person, heaven doesn't really appear as a pleasurable thing. You know, uh, worshiping God in with the saints before his throne, at least we know that much is going to go on in heaven. That, that's not really appealing to an un, unconverted person. But not going to hell is something that will get their attention. So he believed that that was you know, very useful, and he used it to wake people up to their danger. But the third reason I've already given you, and that is that we might more clearly um, understand what hell is, realizing that that is what God has delivered us from, and another reason why we should love Him. So with that in mind, I want us to look at four things. I want us to remember, first of all, that hell is real. Secondly, what the Bible says it's like. Thirdly, that there are people who are there, and there's going to be many more that are going to enter. And then finally, that but for God's grace, this is where we would have been forever. So first of all, let's be reminded that hell is real. Now, here's, here's the problem. We don't see it, right? It's, we can't go somewhere. We can't, you know, pull back the curtain and see the fire and see people that are suffering in there. And the people of the world can't see it either. So how do we know that hell is a real place? And of course, the simple answer to that is that Jesus tells us that hell is real. Now, again, I just want to remind us how we know that what Jesus says is true. It's true because of who He is. We know He's the Son of God. We know He is the prophet sent from God. We believe that because we have the Spirit of God. But again, how are we going to demonstrate that to others? Well, really, the only way that we can is point to the eyewitness accounts in Scripture. You know, they give us their testimonies of what they saw Jesus do. And there, there are many people who, who did see him, and not, not the least of which being raised from the dead, as we were reminded a couple of weeks ago. But they saw him do miracles. Remember those miracles are his divine credentials. This is the way that any prophet was, you know, could, could be seen to have been sent from God, is the fact that they did things that only God could do. Jesus on one occasion said, if you don't believe my words, and they should have because of who he was, but they didn't. He says, if you don't believe my words, believe my works, because these testify to who I am. Well, that's, again, what we need to, to, to think about and what we need to point out to others, because his miracles that were attested by the many who saw them prove that he is a spokesman sent from God. And as this prophet who speaks the word of God, he tells us that hell is a very real place. Now, we're going to read several passages about hell over the next few minutes, but let me just give you one. He warned the scribes and the Pharisees on one occasion in Matthew 23, verse 33. And again, listen to the way that Jesus addressed these hypocrites. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Now, we know that you, you can't 
You don't have to worry about escaping something that doesn't exist. Jesus believed that hell exists. And we also need to believe it. We'll also see the apostles had something to say about this as well. But let's not forget, God has also given to us a, another argument that we can use for the existence of hell. And it comes from general revelation. He's given to all of us a, a conscience. A conscience that convicts us when we sin, that makes us feel guilty, makes us feel uncomfortable. And the reason is because it reminds us that we're accountable. It reminds us that there is a judgment coming when we will all stand before God. You know, R.C. Sproul in one of his uh, videos talking about general revelation, he said that when he's arguing with, with unbelievers and he's trying to convince them of the reality of God and the truth of Scripture, he says that when he's getting nowhere with them, he, he will bring up this particular point. He, he will ask them, how do you deal with your guilt? Because he knows everybody has that guilt, and that guilt comes from the conscience. And he usually found that people can't deal with it. They don't know what to do with it. And he begins then to go from that perspective. How do you deal with it? Well, there's only one way you can get rid of it. And that is you need to trust in the only sacrifice that has ever been made that can take it away. Now, hell is what people are afraid of, whether they realize it or not. Hell is where God punishes sinners for the crimes that they have committed against his justice. Conscience bears that out, and of course, Christ does as well. Now, secondly, hell, what, what's it like? Well, it's described as a place of fire. God tells us in his word that when, when someone dies, when anyone dies unrepentant, that their soul immediately goes into hell and is tormented. Now, that's what Jesus tells us in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And realize that when you bring that up, some are going to say, well, wait a minute. What Jesus was talking about here was a parable. And parables are not generally true-to-life situations. They're simply illustrations. Okay, well, when they bring that up, first of all, remind them that Jesus never concocts some kind of a fantasy to... to to teach spiritual truth. He, he uses things that, are, that people are familiar with and that people know are true. And the second thing is that this parable is the only parable that Jesus ever gave where he actually names an individual. So it's thought that this may be a true event. Okay? But this is what he says regarding the rich man. That the rich man died and was buried... In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Well, what does this teach us about hell? First of all, it tells us that Hell is, is a horrible place. By the way, the word Hades is used here. And the word Hades is often used as the abode of the dead. It's often used to be uh, the, equivalent, the equivalent of the word Sheol in the Old Testament, which is typically translated the grave and doesn't always refer to the afterlife. But here, it clearly does. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now, notice that his body was buried, but his soul was still very much aware of where he was and what his circumstances were. By the way, this, this is an argument against soul sleep. Have you ever heard of that idea? Everyone who dies goes into the grave. Their soul remains connected to their bodies. They remain in this sort of stasis, in this you know, condition until judgment day, and that's when they become awake again. So they call that soul sleep. No, there isn't soul sleep. Um, we see that um, Lazarus was comforted um, in the bosom of Abraham, which is really heaven. And we see that the rich man was immediately aware of his torment. He was in agony in these flames. Well, here's another thing to note, is that the punishment had already begun right after he died. And that punishment is represented as fire. 
Now, we know that these can't be literal flames because literal flames really have no effect on immaterial, uh, an immaterial soul, right? Only his soul was there. But whatever was there, whatever it was that was burning, felt like fire. It burned like fire and it tormented his soul and there was no comfort and there was no relief. Now, Jesus goes on to warn us of differing degrees of punishment in hell. You know, in a parable that has to do with his coming again that I already referred to earlier and the punishment of the unfaithful that they would receive on that day, he said, and that slave, this is in Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few now, notice both of these servants were not forgiven. They were not Christ, genuinely Christ's people. And they're, they're, ha they're being punished. One of them is receiving many lashes. The other is receiving few. So one gets greater punishment, which means hotter flames, more intense pain. And some receive few, less punishment, but still intolerable and it was based upon what they did, on how much they knew about their master's will. Paul also writes to the Romans that the more we resist God, the more we, we store up wrath for ourselves in the day of punishment, the greater our punishment will be, he says in Romans 2, verses 5 and 6. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. You know, you've seen that image of justice in front of the court. You know, justice is blind, holding the scales, and in the scales you place the evidence and everything, you know, the good and the bad are weighed together. Well, the Lord's going to weigh the evidence on that day, and it's going to be just weighted on one side for the wicked. It's all the bad because they did nothing good. But it's a question of how much bad. And the more bad, the more the scales are going to tip towards judgment. And that, again, happens right away when the wicked die. You know, we often talk about people we know that are without Christ. So hopefully we don't do this, but it's good that they passed away because they're no longer suffering. But you see, that isn't the case. If they didn't know Christ, their suffering has just begun. And then you also have that idea of... Um, you know, it's too bad that this person died because they're, no, they're not going to know their judgment for the crimes they've committed. And that's one of the arguments that's actually used against capital punishment. If we put them to death, they're never really going to be punished for their crimes. But the fact is, when they are put to death, if they are unrepentant, that's when the punishment really begins. And of course, the Bible tells us that the just punishment for taking a person's life is that their life be forfeit. But then after the final judgment, this abode of the dead is going to take another form, and that is the lake of fire. I want you to notice fire is still the same in both cases, and here the torment will increase. Now, we noted last week that just before this event, there's going to be something that takes place. Jesus is going to return. He's going to raise all the dead and gather all the living. And when he does that, the souls of the damned that were in hell already suffering in the fire are going to be reunited with their bodies and stand before the Lord. And Jonathan Edwards reminds us that these bodies, we should not think that these bodies are going to be glorious like the resurrected bodies of the saints. They're not. But he says that they will be perfectly suited for an eternity of suffering. He even said the wicked, when they see these bodies, will recoil in horror at, at what they appear to be like, and we can only imagine. But after the judgment, they will be cast then into the lake of fire, soul and body, which means that there will be a new dimension to the sufferings that they will have to experience, not just now in soul like the, the rich man, but also some form of physical suffering that goes along with having now their bodies. And here's something else to think about that's perhaps even more horrifying. 
Some believe that the final judgment where Jesus weighs all, all that the wicked have done and determines their judgment really only determines the beginning level of judgment, not the final level. Joseph Bellamy uh, wrote a book that Jonathan Edwards appears to have approved the, the book by giving his endorsement to it. I don't know if that means he endorsed everything in it. But Joseph Bellamy represented the lake of fire more like um, not just a static lake where people are sort of in different levels or maybe different depths, but rather as a bottomless lake, as sort of a whirlpool that is constantly descending and that throughout eternity the damned continue to sink further and further into greater levels of torment. Now what he would say is this, that their punishment was already intolerable when they entered into the lake of fire, but it continually grows worse because of the sins that they continue to commit against God in hell. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, God is just, and He's going to bring even every idle word into judgment against the wicked. But why just when they're alive? Why not when they're dead? Why not as they're resurrected in soul and body, why not the sins they continue to commit? Because they are going to continue to commit sins. Is God not going to punish them for those as well? Well, because they continue to sin against God, and how can they continue to sin? Well, in hell, they're going to, they're going to hate God. They're not going to love Him as they should. They're not going to honor Him as they should. They're going to be spewing out blasphemy. They're going to be thinking evil thoughts. They're going to have evil intents in their hearts. And even if they can't consummate those desires... In hell, they still have them, and those are still sinful, and they are still crimes against God. And so Bellamy argues their punishment goes deeper and deeper, becomes greater and greater as time goes on. You know, one, one thing that may make it even worse than this is that um, the possibility, and we, we've all heard about this, but I don't know if you thought about it, the possibility of the tormented tormenting each other. Okay, have you ever seen those um, caricatures of hell where you've got the devil, you know, looking like a devil in his pitchfork and the, the damned are in hell and he's, you know, he's tormenting them with that pitchfork. Have you ever read Dante's Inferno? If you have, he, he pictures hell as basically a descending level of circles and at each level it gets worse and worse till you get to the very center. But at each level, it seems like maybe not every level, but on many of these levels, there are demons that are tormenting the damned, such as uh, hacking the damned into pieces and throwing them into a lake of tar, and then they come back together. They try to call, they try to, to get some relief by coming out of the tar, and the demon pitches his pitchfork into them, and throws them on land, and hews them into pieces, and then throws them back into the fire. I mean, just these, these horrible ideas, but Dante was thinking that this may very well be the case because the devil and his demons are also in the fire. And the question is, is there any interaction uh, between us, you know, well, not, hopefully not us, but the wicked, the, the damned, and the demons? Some believe that that may be the case. So the tormented may be tormenting others. But let's not forget the most terrifying part of this whole thing, and that is what hell actually is. Hell is what it is because it's here that God is pouring out His wrath against sin. Now, if you were to ask most evangelicals today what hell is, they would say hell is the absence of God. Hell is the place that God has created away from His presence where He puts those that refuse to receive Him, and so they kind of went on their merry way and dropped into a place that was meant for the devil and his angels. But he just sort of built this fire over here, and people wander into it, and God has really nothing to do with what's going on in there. But, but that really isn't the case. Edwards would remind us, and this is absolutely biblical and true, that the fire that burns in hell is actually God. Okay? It's His wrath being poured out on sinners, on the guilty. And so here's another interesting thought. When Jesus saves us from hell, what he's actually saving us from is God. You know, we think of 
redemption. God buys us back from the marketplace of sin. He, he saves us. He's not redeeming us from the devil. He's redeeming us from God's judgment that we would have to face forever in hell. So Edwards would say, God is the fire that burns in hell. You see, that's what hell is. Hell is God's wrath. So we know that hell exists, and we know that hell is an extremely horrible place. And, and by the way, Jonathan Edwards has been criticized as exaggerating hell. But as John Gerstner, his, uh, probably his most faithful expositor, says, Jonathan Edwards could not exaggerate hell. He said, a thousand Jonathan Edwards could not exaggerate hell. It's impossible to exaggerate hell. It is much worse than we can possibly conceive. Words cannot do justice to what hell is like. Thirdly, we need to realize that there are many people who will have to endure this judgment, this hell, forever. You know, the, the doctrine of hell is so terrible that the tendency is to try to put it out of our minds. I mean, how often do you think about hell? It's interesting that every Christian cult, and by the way, a Christian cult is obviously not a true religion, it's a false religion, it's leading people to hell, but every Christian cult denies hell by affirming either universalism or annihilation. Everyone's saved or everyone's destroyed. Now, those who teach universal redemption, by the way, that question came up on Wednesday when we were studying, uh, I, I forget exactly why it came up. It was because of, of the... Um, Jesus' prayer on the cross, when he cried, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, was he praying that the whole world would be saved? Okay. Well, no, and it's clear from his prayer on the cross, no. But they want to believe that Jesus died for all mankind. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Say, everyone's going to be saved. Well, obviously that's a misinterpretation of that, of that passage, but notice in our passage, Jesus says to the goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. And then he says, these will go away into eternal punishment. Clearly, not everyone's going to be saved. John also writes in Revelation 20, verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There are people suffering. That's what the, the Bible rep tells us. There are people suffering right now in hell, and there will be many cast in on the day of judgment. Now, not only is universalism not true, but as I mentioned before, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that there's going to be many more in the lake of fire that are going to enter into the eternal kingdom of God. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. For the gate is wide... And the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Does it sound to you like Jesus is teaching universalism here? He's teaching that very few are actually going to be saved comparatively. Now, others believe in annihilation. The idea that, that God is, is too loving, He's too merciful, He's too compassionate to allow this kind of suffering. So he simply destroys the unrepentance when they die. Their, their souls go out of existence. Now, besides the passages we've just read that tell us that God has and will send many to punish them there forever, think about what Jesus said about Judas. This was an argument that Edwards used, and I think it makes perfect sense. Matthew 26, verse 24. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Okay, now the question Edwards asked is this. If annihilationism, you know, is true, if, if as soon as Judas died, he was annihilated, then this passage wouldn't make any sense, right? What's the difference between never having been born and annihilation. There's really no difference. If you're not born, you don't exist. If you're annihilated, you don't exist. But Jesus says it would have been good for him if he had never been born. That is, if he had been annihilated, that would be good. Why? 
because now he must suffer forever for his crimes, not the least of which is to be in Jesus' inner circle to have seen and heard everything that, that was there to see and hear, and then to betray him. The judgment for him is going to be very severe. If you read Dante's Inferno someday, you'll find that Judas is in the very center of hell. And in hell, Satan is, is fixed in the center, and he's got three faces, and in those three faces are three mouths, and uh, one for each face. And in the mouth of each of those faces is, is one individual who has lived and died, who is eternally being chewed on by, by Satan. And Judas is one of them, okay? The other two, I forget who they are offhand, but, but they are those who have betrayed their patron. I think, um, was it um, Brutus, maybe one, who betrayed Caesar? No. I forget who the other one is, okay? But judgment will be worse because of the privileges uh, that, that he had. So again, it would have been good for him if he had not been born. Annihilationism is really the same thing. The reason why it would have been good for him not to be born is because he's going to have to suffer forever for what he has done. And that's true of everyone who dies unrepentant. Now, again, let me just remind you, forever is a very long time. And I think that illustration that Thomas Watson used is, is a good illustration of that, where he says, think of the earth as, a, as just a giant ball of sand. And every 1,000 years, make it a million years, make it, make it a billion years, every billion years, a bird flies by and grabs one grain of sand and takes it away. Now, he says, think about how long it would take to just carry the entire world away. He said, if, if hell lasted only that long, there would be some hope for the damned souls in hell that they will one day be released from that torment. But he says the fact that it's not that way. It's forever. It, it never ends. Then there is... No hope. As a matter of fact, Dante, if you remember, if you, if you ever read the book, The Inferno, there's a doorway that leads into hell, and as the angel is taking, um, I forget who it is that, that is the, uh, the, the traveler, to show him the inferno. As he walks through the door, he sees this, this, this saying over the top of the door that says, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. And that's exactly what hell is, a place of no hope. Most of the human race by far who have died are now in hell. Virtually everybody who lived during the flood, and we know most, most of the people who have lived in, in darkness are there. Most by far who die today are going to go there. The only way that anyone can escape is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. The vast, vast I think the vast majority of mankind today still has not heard about him which means that they're going to perish for their sins apart from Christ. God does not judge them on a different standard. The gospel is not written in nature or in the stars. The only way they can be saved is by hearing about Christ, which is why we do the work of missions, why we evangelize. And we should let the reality of that motivate us to, to try to reach out to as many as we can because we can only do so much in the very short time that we have. But this is what they are in danger of, and most of the people we know that are outside of Christ, this is what they're going to have to endure forever. Now, finally, this is what we would have had to endure forever if God had not spared us by His grace. That's the reason why we need to be convinced that hell is a real place. And hearing it should make us tremble, okay? If we don't understand that it's real, if we don't believe that, if we don't believe it's as horrible as the, as the Scripture presents it, if we don't believe that, that we came into this world headed for that particular judgment, again, because of Adam's rebellion, because of all the sins we've committed, we are never going to appreciate what God has done for us and so love Him as we should. So let me just make a suggestion to all of us, and that is rather than putting these things out of our minds because they're horrible to think about, Rather, we should meditate on them. I think, I think often. 
to let them stir our hearts up to love the Lord for having delivered us from them and to remind us why it is we need to reach the lost with the gospel because that is the only way they're going to be spared this eternal fire. Well, with that in mind, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And as we pray, let's um, again think about the Lord's table. It's reminding us of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done that we might be saved, that we might be spared. He gave his life. He suffered hell on the cross so that we wouldn't have to endure it for all eternity. And that should make us very thankful. So let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.